All right, get ready because uh, today we are going to be taking a deep dive into something pretty fundamental, the second law of thermodynamics. Oh, this is a good one. Yeah, it is. You know the one that says everything tends towards disorder? Like your room always gets messier if you don't clean it. Right. Or if you if you make an omelet, you can't unscramble the egg. Exactly. But we're not just talking about like messy rooms or scrambled eggs. We're going kind of deeper this time. Much deeper. We're going to be looking at the second law through this really interesting lens of computation. Yeah. And to do that, we're going to be using the work of Stephen Wolfram. Yes. Wolfram's ideas are, well, they're super fascinating. And we'll be exploring some excerpts from his writings. Yeah, that's right. But what's really cool about this deep dive is, well, it might actually challenge some assumptions that I think a lot of us have. Oh, yeah. About oh. the second law. For sure. Like, did you know that the second law isn't always true? That's one of the big ones, yeah. Yeah, and what does it have to do with things that just seem random, like the digits of pi? Right, totally random. But they're not, really. Right, exactly. Or those crazy patterns that you get from simple computer programs. Oh, yeah, you know those. So to kick things off, I think it would be helpful to get right to, I guess, Wolfram's core idea. Yeah, sure. So basically he's saying that randomness... It can actually be generated within a system. Okay, wait, hold on. Yeah. So you're telling me that randomness doesn't have to come from something outside? That's exactly right. It can come from inside the system. Yeah, intrinsically. Whoa. Yeah, just by following really simple rules. Okay, now that's something I'm going to need you to explain a bit more. Okay, so he uses this famous example. It's called Rule 30, and it's a type of cellular automaton. Okay, um, let's break that down. What is a cellular automaton? Okay, picture this. It's a line of cells, just one dimension. Okay, I'm picturing it. And each cell can either be black or white. I like it. Okay, so rule 30, it's just this simple rule that determines how the color of each cell changes based on its neighbors. Uh -huh. You start with just a single black cell, and then you apply the rule over and over again. Okay, and what happens? Does it just create like a simple pattern that repeats? You'd think so, right. But it doesn't. What you get is this surprisingly complex pattern with like triangles and these other crazy shapes that seem to appear at random. No way. I got to see this. You should look it up. It's pretty yeah. wild. Okay. Wow. I'm looking at it. And you're right. It really is a unique pattern. Right. It doesn't look like something that would come from such a simple rule at all. Yeah. And here's the thing. Even though the underlying rule is super simple, the output looks random. It's kind of like the digits of pi, you know? Uh -huh. They come from a pretty simple algorithm, but they just seem to have no order to them. Right. Okay, so back to rule 30. How does this connect to entropy and the second law of thermodynamics? Well, the key is this concept that Wolfram calls computational irreducibility. All right, I'm all ears. What is that? Okay, so it basically means you can't predict what rule 30 is going to do without actually running the whole computation step by step. Hmm. So our brains... They can't just jump to the answer. Nope. And even powerful computers can't do it either. So we're forced to actually go through the computation step by step. That's right. Because the system is too complex. It's too complex, exactly. There's no shortcut. Mm. We can't see through the patterns to that simple rule underneath. And because we can't predict it easily, it looks random to us. I see. And Wolfram's argument is that this is kind of what's happening with the second law of thermodynamics as well. Okay, so you're saying the second law, it's not just about gas molecules in a box spreading out, getting more random. Right. That's how we usually think of it. Yeah. But he's saying it's actually about something much deeper, something more universal. Wow. Okay. But how does Wolfram, how does he connect this to actual physics, like to how gas molecules actually behave? Okay. So he starts with this classic model in physics. Okay. You know, a box full of gas molecules. Yeah. Like those those simulations, the molecules are bouncing all over the place. Exactly. Like those hard sphere simulations. Yeah. So they start out organized, but then boom, 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 they collide and they're flying everywhere. That's the second law, right? Things get more chaotic. Classic second law. Yeah. Yeah. But then Wolfram does something super interesting. He starts simplifying the model step by step. Okay. So he goes from spheres to squares and then to even simpler models where it's just on a grid, like the cellular automata we talked about. Oh, interesting. And the point of all this is to see if this basic idea of things getting more random, if it still holds up, even when you simplify everything. Makes sense. And what he finds is amazing. Even in these simplified models, things still tend towards randomness. Wow. It's as if he's boiled down the entire second law to just a few lines of code. So he's basically saying the second law, it might not be about physical things like gas molecules at all, but 
something way more fundamental, like about how information gets processed in any system. That's exactly right. And that takes us to some big questions like, could the universe actually be some kind of giant computer at its core? Whoa, that's a whole other deep dive. We might have to save that for another time. Uh -huh, yeah. But I am curious about this other puzzle. The second law says that things get more random over time. Right. But aren't the laws of physics reversible? Mm, good point. Like, shouldn't things be able to get less random too? How does that work? Yeah, that's a great question. It's kind of mind bending to think about. It is. How can both be true? Yeah, it's a good question. It's kind of like saying if you scramble an egg, shouldn't you be able to like jiggle the pan just right and have it unscramble itself? Yeah, but that's not how it works. So what's going on here? How do we make sense of that? Well, Wolfram has this uh, pretty mind-bending way to visualize this. So imagine a system that, as it's moving forward in time, it's getting more random, more random. Then it hits this point and it gets more organized for a 3D bit, just briefly. And then as it keeps moving like backward in time now, it gets more random again. Hold on, hold on. Yeah. So you're saying it's like... You can unscramble the egg, but just for a split second, and then it scrambles right back up again. Exactly. The thing is, we don't see things unrandomizing because to do that, you'd need a really specific starting point. Like to unscramble the egg, you'd have to arrange all the proteins in just the right way. And then when you add heat, it would like uncook itself. So it's not impossible, just yeah. crazy unlikely. Like trying to find one specific grain of sand on a beach. Makes sense. Mm. So where does this idea of equilibrium fit into all of this? Right. Good point. So equilibrium, think of it as the state of uniform randomness. It's like there's no arrow of time anymore. You couldn't tell if time was going forward or backward. So it's like the universe just gives up and says, all right, I'm as spread out and random as I can be. I'm done. <laughs> uh -huh. In a way, yeah. But even in this state of equilibrium, there are still tiny fluctuations happening. Like imagine a still pond. But there are little ripples and eddies. Okay, yeah. And every once in a while, really long while, these fluctuations could theoretically make something that looks organized appear out of nowhere, like our unscrambled egg. So it's like the universe is playing cosmic roulette, right. and every once in a blue moon, we see order pop up from the chaos. Exactly, but it's so unlikely, we pretty much never see it on a large scale. Okay, so we've talked about randomness and reversibility and equilibrium, but what about entropy itself? Ah! How does Wolfram explain that in this whole computation framework? Well, he uses a really helpful visual analogy. I like visual. So imagine you're looking at our box of gas molecules, but you can only see a blurry version. Like a really low resolution photo. Exactly. Entropy is basically how many different ways could you arrange the molecules so that they still create the same blurry image. So the more ways to rearrange them without changing the blurry picture, the higher the entropy. You got it. And as a system gets more random, there are more and more possible microscopic arrangements that all look the same at that level. So it's not just about things being messy. It's about how many possible states there are that all look the same to us. Exactly. And here's where Wolfram takes it even further. He says entropy isn't just about physical stuff. It's a much deeper idea about information and how we as observers can describe the world. So entropy is about information and how we make sense of things. That's really interesting. Right. And this takes us to another fascinating concept, Maxwell's demon. Ooh, that sounds ominous. What is that? Imagine this tiny little being. He's got this tiny door between two compartments filled with gas molecules. Okay. And this demon, he can see each individual molecule, and he can open and close the door to sort them, like to make order from chaos. So he's like a tiny bouncer, only letting the cool molecules into his club. Exactly. <laughs> but by doing this, it seems like he's violating the second law. He's decreasing entropy. Hmm. So could this demon actually exist, or is it just a thought experiment? Well, Wolfram ties it back to computation. Of course. He asks, could we create a computational demon that's so good at predicting the system that it could sort molecules and decrease entropy? Okay. Maybe. But here's the problem. It would only work if this demon could actually outsmart the system itself. And that's where computational irreducibility comes back, right? Exactly. If the system is too complex to predict, even a super smart demon couldn't break the second law. Hmm. So maybe the second law isn't really a fundamental law of the universe, but more like a consequence of our own limitations. It's a fascinating idea, right? It's like the second law is more about what we can know than about the universe itself. Right. So what about the fate of the universe? Does this mean we're all headed towards a boring, lukewarm cosmic soup? What does Wolfram say about that? 
it's it's not as grim as it sounds. You know, we talked about computational irreducibility and how there are limits to what we can know as observers, right? Well, Wolfram thinks that even if the universe hits this state of like maximum entropy, at least from our perspective, it doesn't actually mean the computation stops. It just means we might not be able to understand it anymore. Oh, OK. So like the universe becomes this giant file that's encrypted and we've lost the key to decode it. That's a great analogy. The information from the past would all still be there in the future state of the universe, just in a way we can't decipher. But what if there were other observers way in the future, maybe who could crack the code? They might see patterns and complexity where we just see randomness. So the universe doesn't actually become boring. It's just that we might not be able to understand it anymore. It's our limitations, not the universe's. Exactly. Our brains, they evolve to see and process information at a certain scale, right? We see trees, clouds, mountains, but not the individual atoms they're made of. What if there are observers out there with much more powerful computational abilities? Maybe they can see meaning in what seems random to us. That's a pretty humbling thought. Like, there could be all this complexity and beauty that we're just not equipped to even perceive. And Wolfram takes it even further. He talks about these ever-evolving observers who are constantly getting better at computation, exploring this huge space of possible computations. He calls it the Ruliad. You mentioned the Ruliad earlier. Can you remind me what that is? Sure. Think of it as this landscape of every possible rule-based system, like an endless library. Each point on the landscape is a different set of rules, a different way the universe could work. We, as observers, were stuck at our specific point in the Ruliad, limited by our current computational abilities. So we're like explorers in a vast new territory. And the laws of physics, they're just the local rules for our little corner of the Ruliad. Exactly. And as we get better at computation, develop new technologies, learn more, we're essentially moving through the Ruliad and encountering new rules, new possibilities for how things can work. So the laws of physics are not actually set in stone. They're dynamic. They depend on where you are in the Ruliad. That's a pretty wild concept. It is. It means that what looks like a universal law from one perspective might just be a local rule from another. As we explore more, we might run into systems that seem to completely defy the laws we thought were fundamental systems, where even the second law doesn't hold up. That's both exciting and scary at the same time. Exciting because it opens up so many possibilities. Yeah. But scary because it makes you question everything you thought you knew about reality. It's a huge shift in how we see things. Instead of thinking of the second law as this like cosmic death sentence, we can see it as a reflection of what we currently understand. And our understanding is always changing as we explore the Ruliad and all its computational possibilities. Wow, this has been an incredible deep dive. We've gone from scrambled eggs to the fate of the universe, from computational irreducibility to the very nature of observers and the laws of physics. It's been great exploring all these ideas with you. I hope it's given you a new way to think about the second law, a way that embraces complexity and all the potential of the universe and its observers. It definitely has. Any final thoughts for our listeners as they head back out into the world? I'd just say the universe is way more strange and wonderful than we can imagine. The second law, it's still important, but it's just one piece of a much bigger puzzle, one that's still unfolding. So keep exploring, keep questioning, and never stop being amazed by the world around us. Beautifully said. This deep dive has definitely shown us that the journey of discovery is far from over. There's always more to learn, more to explore. Who knows? Maybe one day you'll make a discovery that changes how we understand the universe. So stay curious, keep an open mind, and until next time, happy exploring.